Hello and welcome to the Oberlin Como Piano Festival Academy, presented by the Oberlin Conservatory of Music. My name is Stanislav Yudenich, and, and I'm here with my daughter, Maria, as we will jointly be conducting the interviews with the featured artists. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to participate here and delve a little bit into the lives and mastery of the five artists who will be giving these master classes. Joining us today will be President and Artistic Director of the International Piano Academy Lake Como and our dear longtime family friend and piano master William Grant Navarre. Welcome, Mr. Navarre. Thank you. I'm enjoying myself, but I'm enjoying myself at home. <laughs> but we'll, don't you think we would enjoy a better face to face somewhere in Lake Como over oh, yes. some beautiful yes. scenery? Don't yes, and how many memories we have of that place, right? Wow, yeah. Tempe, Tempus Fujit, Tempus Fujit. Time flies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mr. Navarro, let's first talk about the International Piano Academy in Lake Como in Italy and how it all started <laughs> with you. What were the ideas behind the creation of this exclusive academy and how did it gain success over the years? Oh, that's a long question. Let me take it apart <laughs> as it goes on. But let me just say a little bit about the, the genesis or the beginning of this uh, school. I was contacted, I think it was in 1993, by a young uh, industrialist, German industrialist, by the name of uh, Theo Lieven. Now, he was a friend of an old friend of mine, Hannes Keller, who is a deep sea diver, by the way, and of genius but on the other side, but that's something else. Anyway, he, my friend, uh, Hannes Keller contacted me and told me, listen, uh, we, I have here in my house, they live in Zurich, by the way, a very wealthy man who is eventually interested in doing something for young musicians that's important. What do you suggest that we do? I never thought that they were intended that I should be involved, but then they came back and said, well, we thought we would make, have a competition, make a new competition. I say, oh God, no, don't do another competition. We've got enough of those. We have a problem is what the people win competitions do later. What do they do afterwards? Because they had problems, you know? So that's a little bit how it started. And I said, no way are we going to do another competition. I, say, I said, I agree with Bartok. Competitions are for horses and not for people. <laughs> and in any case, the best uh, elements are sort of eliminated immediately. And then at the last, I don't want to have that on my conscience, okay? so. I said, don't, let's not do a competition. But I think what you should do is to get together an, a very high level of master piano teachers from around the world and sort of promote or the legacy of great piano playing. Because I felt that at that time, I'm talking about 1993, that we were beginning to see signs of deterioration in in, uh, in teaching, in teaching. But there were still some, you know, fantastic people around. I happened to know some of these people. For example, Carl Rick Schnabel, who was the son of uh, Arthur Schnabel. And I uh, sort of met by chance, uh, Leon Fleischer, who was playing a concert in the city where I was living at the time, that is in Geneva. So, uh, and then strange enough, uh, uh, Bashkirov, uh, who has just recently died, Dmitry Bashkirov. So I was able to meet these people. I asked them, listen, would you be interested eventually to come and teach a very high level of young students uh, for a year? Now, the, the, the whole thing, and this was the important thing, that these young people selected who were supposed to be exceptionally gifted would be given sort of a life, not like a year's pension, everything paid 
to eat, to sleep, to practice, whatever. And that should be a real stimulus to achieve higher uh, goals in their, in their formation. This year's <laughs> Festival Academy is dedicated to Futsong, Leon Fleischer, and Bashkir, Dmitry Bashkir, three of our founding members of, Como, of the Como Academy who passed away this year. We're deeply- In the sad. space of not even a year, within nine months. Exactly, yes. So we are dedicated this academy, uh, th this event to, to them. And uh, of course, we are deeply saddened and uh, that we lost uh, such great souls and mentors. Can we talk about them, Maestro? Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, let's talk in order. I first um, uh, contacted Fleischer, Leon Fleischer, through his old teacher, who happened to have been uh, Karl Uwe Schnabel, because Schnabel I knew from friends, we'd met each other, and I asked him, he said, of course I'll come. And I said, what do you think about your student years ago? He said, okay, I'll try to get to him. He didn't get to him, but Fleischer was just at that moment performing in Geneva. So after, after the concert, which was wonderful, I went back to see him. I said, well, listen, we have this uh, plan. Would you be interested? He said, well, maybe. He said, invite me to dinner. <laughs> so that's what I did. I invited him to dinner, to my house. He liked the evening. And he said, oh, that's a great idea because it will be on Lake Como. Now, you have to understand, what is Lake Como for Fleischer and for Schnabel? Lake Como was the place where Arthur Schnabel, the great pianist, German pianist, took refuge after the Crystal Night of Berlin, you know? So he knew immediately, he was Jewish, that his, his uh, time was not going to stay long in, he was not going to stay long in uh, Germany. So he almost immediately left there, okay? And came to Como where he founded a school, a piano school, something like the school that he had already in Germany, in Berlin. He was a, the teacher at a school there, okay? So he came to Como, he was protected by my teacher, who was very young at that time, who was one of his students, his name is Carlo Zecchi, and Zecchi got him the protection of Mussolini, can you imagine, to be able to live in Italy, but only until Hitler came into the picture and then they had to flee again, they went to the USA. So, Carlo Schnabel, who was a very young man, his father, they founded this school, on Lake Como. And when this industrialist told me that they had bought a property on Lake Como, I knew that if I told that to Fleischer, he would be interested. Uh -huh. And he said, of course I would come. He said, in this way, my life comes full circle. Let's talk yeah. a little bit about you. So starting at the very beginning of your life, you were a part of many firsts. I was born in Virginia. Virginia was still a very, well, rather segregated state. I'm talking about, I was born in 1941, okay? So we still, we had to go through the war years. I remember the war years slightly, okay? But uh, still, it was a segregated state. However, uh, my family was Catholic. Okay, and the Catholic schools were the first schools in the USA to mix the, you know, to have mixed races, you know. So the first, the first schools desegregated in the USA were Catholic schools, not public schools. So in 1954, when the Supreme Court passed this decision, the next, uh, in autumn of that year, September of the year, I was able to go to a non-segregated school. But I have to tell you a little bit before, because I started music before that. I was uh, in my freshman year when I went to, uh, to this non-segregated Catholic school. But before that, I was just a big lump of, mass, who was sleeping all the time, who was very weak and had asthma. 
I had serious asthma, real serious. Many times my family said, oh, well, you know, he's going to die. So, <laughs> you know, well, they thought, now it's really th very serious. No one was thinking, <laughs> they let me do what I wanted because they said, poor thing, let him do what he wants. So uh, they noticed something very strange. My mother, who knew classical music, uh, would play classical music around the house. And then she said, you know, every time as a child, I play classical music, he starts to cry. He's crying every time I play classical music. So something must be there. He must like it, something. Yeah. So why not give him a piano, see what happens? So we didn't have a teacher, but my grandmother came to live with us. In those days, your grandmothers could, could they didn't put them in nursing homes. They took them into the house, okay? My grandmother came to live with us and she was an excellent pianist and she began to teach me the piano. That's how I started. When I was about nine years old, okay? In, my grandfather was born in 1865, the year that the Civil War stopped. He was born at that time, okay? As he was that, if, I don't know if you know, but they had some years, what they call the reconstruction where black people could go to universities and, you know, they said, and my father was one of the first uh, black people in USA to get a higher degree of education. He was a doctor of divinity. And what was his speciality? Antique languages, that is Latin and Greek. So he was a Latin and Greek scholar. For what reason, we don't know. <laughs> so anyway, this, I became, I was very talented when I was young and they started to uh, show me around. It's something curious. I guess I was curious. Uh, so I started playing little concerts here and there. And finally, finally, they found a teacher who was white. She was not black, who was a student. Can you imagine this? A student, uh, Alexander Silotti. Amazing. And the, uh, she was a, yeah, Silotti in Juilliard. She was a student of the Silotti in Juilliard. And, and she, she was there in Virginia? She was there. She was there. She, she came from a very wealthy, she was a very wealthy lady, okay? Uh, so she didn't need to really to make concerts. Uh, she played the piano for her pleasure, but she was good enough to go to Juilliard and study with Silotti. That's an amazing story. That's her. That is your first teacher. That was my first real teacher. She taught me the basics as she tried of the list technique because <laughs> Silotti was a pupil of list, you know? It's Leon Fleischer, you told me how he described your ability to find the, the, the young artists. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to talk about your passion for teaching. It is clear that uh, in the process of creating the wonderful academy, uh, mm -hmm. we did. You have chosen many, many talented young artists who have uh, had or are continuing having successful uh, artistic careers. Mm -hmm. What are the most important values and lessons uh, that you would like to pass uh, on the next generation of young artists? Well, listen, let's go back a little bit to what we have lost because we have lost. In fact, we have lost more than one thinks. Uh, there was uh, always this tradition, tradition of passing the plane, you know? One generation passes it to the other. Now this is breaking down, seriously. Much of the reason is because, if you ask me, uh, people are now studying for the wrong reasons. You know, they are studying music. A lot of people, young people study music to win a competition. Why is that? I mean, I thought you still studied music because you loved it, you know, <laughs> begin with it. <laughs> and then secondly, if you, I always tell a student, if you can live without music, don't do music, do something else. Be a dentist. You got a lot of money with the dentist. But the if you- be like a virus that you cannot get rid yeah, of. Yeah, it's, right? it's a passion. You have to have passion, okay? If you don't have the passion for it, don't do it. Please don't do it. It's, it costs too, it's too heavy. What you have to sacrifice is too much, okay? And people don't want to sacrifice that anymore, so. 
Mm. People, a lot of people can play adequately. Someone said, you know, the level of uh, mediocrity is going up. <laughs> the level of mediocrity is getting higher. It's true. The real personalities, the real people who have something to say and know how to say it is becoming more and more rare. And because we, we are missing now a whole job. Listen, we had three of our top students die in nine months time. You mean top teachers? Top teachers, two of our top teachers who died just like that. They are irreplaceable. Where do we find those people? We don't, you understand? So that's why, and I'm very proud, sir, personally, especially for someone like you to have gone to Como, you have learned what you have learned and you can share it. You, you take the flame and you can go on with it. I think it's you our see? obligation to share, not only me, yeah. everybody who went there, it's yeah. important because the, the information is unbelievable. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. And you know, my, my fortune is that <laughs> I wasn't the student, but I heard everything. And I learned so much myself. I learned a huge amount because I didn't have any stress. You people had the stress and I could just listen and absorb, you know? So I was able to uh, do that. Leon Fleischer said, look, you have the best nose for talent in the business. That's what he said. That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah, that's you know, what he best said. Nose, and you truly do. <laughs> he yeah. said, I don't have a good nose for talent. He said, I don't but you have the best nose in the business. You see, I don't have to promote anybody. The, I only have to choose what I think is the best. So I'm not saying, well, this is the friend of my friend and I, I get in, you know, no, you have to really be good if you're going to do this, okay? Yeah. Talent, talent. Well, thank you so much for sharing. It's just so short. <laughs> Maria, what do you think? I'm, I'm amazed, really, because, of course, you know, some of my favorite moments with you have been during dim dinner, you know, and you share your incredible musical adventures and your personal, personal stories, but this was, this was so enlightening. Thank you for, for your time, for sharing with us, and I'm very much looking forward to meeting in person. <laughs> yeah, Thank as you. soon as possible. Yeah, as soon as possible. <laughs> we, miss, we miss the experience. Dear yeah. Michael. Well, we are hoping like mad that this thing will be over with soon so we can get together it will, again. For sure it will be. We'll be yeah. over. And, yeah. uh, By yeah. the way, we always said we would like to teach people not only music, but how to live. But that was part of the, well, that was part of, it's mentoring. That was part of the yeah. uh, Como because we were yeah. having- To be life. good people, to be good people, to be sharing people, sharing. help people, okay? Yeah. That's yeah. a part of the, our I, mission. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. And uh, of course, we're looking forward to the classes. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, to the next and soon. Arrivederci e a presto. Arrivederci. Yeah. <laughs> okay.
with that. Rameau was, uh, of course, one of the most important uh, Baroque masters of a level of Couperin. Now, Couperin was the French composer that Bach himself admired the most. Very strange, in spite of this, he made no transcriptions of Couperin's music. You know, he made transcriptions of uh, Italians, but nothing of Couperin, who he liked very much. Now, Rameau was a contemporary of Couperin and Bach, by the way, and uh, he was what we call a late bloomer because he started writing music quite late in his life. He had his success late, but he was a fantastic harpsichordist, okay? Because he started playing harpsichord quite, quite young. And then he started writing musical um, theory books. And the most important was something called the Traité d'Harmonie. He wrote this book and he submitted it to the sort of international jury, which was in Bologna, by the way. And uh, people from all around Europe could read it and give their opinion. If they agreed, they didn't agree. So one of the people who didn't agree, agree was Bach. Bach wrote an opinion say, okay, I don't agree with this uh, new type of music, but I must say that it, it, the music of Rameau himself goes very well with these new theories, okay? So he said, I don't like the, the attitude, I don't like the theory, but Mr. Ramos' music sounds fantastic with his theories, okay? Here, we've got to, we will talk about it later, we've got to see what kind of character was this Mr. Rameau, okay? But I would like you to start first playing the Tant de la Plante, and then we will talk, all right? Go ahead. No, I prefer you to uh, play it again so you can do the second reprise. It has to be go, just play the beginning and then go to the second reprise, okay? Okay. Um... Okay. It's okay. Okay. Now look, this is one reason why I wanted you to play it first. 
because your your uh, how do you say interpretive bias or let's say the way you play this music is that quite right in the sense it's Ramo now Ramo himself was a very strict man and he was not at all a romantic composer so you're playing this this piece much too romantically and without enough control of rhythm, okay? Because what Rameau was the strongest in was the rhythm. He was obsessed with the rhythm. So even if it's called the tender complaints, it still has to be extremely precise and in tempo than you are doing, you understand? Now, there are a few things of concerning the ornamentation that are very important. You always have to... We say in English, in French, imbatre, being that the first of the ornament is together, is that, it has to be all the time, okay? Also, I don't know if you looked at your, your left hand, your phrasing. You have to do it, okay? I would be careful with your pedal. Don't over pedal, okay? Can you play this? <laughs> Just with keeping the left hand extremely steady. And then you, did you see the ornament here? Is that what you do? I'm not sure. Where? Uh, here? Yeah. What do you do? I think you do this. What do you do? I do like... Uh, uh, That's a, what do you do? You don't... It's not right. You do this. I would prefer to make a longer trill actually there. Okay? Not a short one. You do, I think, something. Right? Yeah. So every everything has to be on the beat, or because this one is on the every, second. Yes. Everything on the second. has to be strictly on the beat. Okay? You can't play your ornament before the beat. You can play it sometimes after the beat if you're doing something different in the left hand. You understand? Okay, let's do that. So I would try to. So you see that? Oh, we can. Both of them are possible. Okay, but you have to have the appoggiatura. You can. You understand? Mm -hmm. Long trail on that one. You understand? Uh, this one? Yeah, you can. No, that's okay. Okay. But you can make here. You understand? So we, that you can make a long trail. Okay. You 
You mean on the left hand? No, the right hand. Then, but together. See, the ornament has to be together with the first note. The first note of the ornament has to be with the left hand. You can't play it before. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, always. Okay. Can you go go ahead? Then. You see that? That has to be on the beat, all right? Yeah. Uh... What do you have there? Because I have this. You don't have that? Um, bum, 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 bum. You mean it's like a, in brackets, right? No, it's it's it's, it's not in brackets. It's it's a, it's a, the ornament itself. You have a little thing before it and a little thing after it, meaning that. So like this. That's right. That's right. You understand? Yeah, it's like in brackets. It's in, oh, it's, it's like in brackets, but it's not in brackets, actually. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's, not, it's not, listen, they do put something, for example, they put something in brackets in the left hand, but that doesn't concern us, okay? So can you, I like, I like long trills there. So uh, until the end? Until the end. You see you. Okay, still a little a little breathe. Okay. A little breathe, but I like this. That's right. And always on the beat. Right? Yeah, I do it on the beat, but I just do it really quickly, like Yeah, good. Okay. Flash me. right hand, the ornaments are right. I still think we don't have your phrasing enough in your bass. You, you know. In, in tempo, you know what I mean? Then, phrasing, right? So the left hand has to be really quite soft, right? But very equal, not, not so rhapsodic. That is not with a rubato in the left hand, okay? The rubato can go some way in your right hand, but it should never go to your left hand, okay? Ramo is very strict about keeping the measure on the beat, never varying your accompaniment, okay? So let's go. You finish. I have it. You can do it. You can do that as well. You mean the? Right. You mean the last time or? You know, the first time, but it will come several times. But he writes two possibilities. I don't know if you see it. Do you have it in brackets under the uh, number three? Do you have that in the bass? Yeah, yeah. There is like a there is like a little how uh, do you say a little diagonal line on the yeah that's the right. top. So you can you're doing I think something else. I do like this. But how do you do it with the bass? I don't think. I do like this. Uh, well, the bass I play at the end, so it's like. You can do it, like, but you also can do the contrary. You can do it like that too. Like 
like this? How I, I, I didn't get it? You said. I don't know, it's like when you play, I, I lost the sound. Like, uh, okay. Can you try? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, try. You know, you can do it many ways. Yeah, yeah. And okay. even you can do it one way, one way. So the bass first, okay. Yeah, listen, you can do it the other way, your way, you can do it as well, so you can all right? Change. Yeah, yeah. You can change, maybe one way, one time, the other way, another time. Okay, so now let's do our first reprise. So, in battle, I had a question to this. Can you, can we do a, like a, like twice? I mean, like, is that too much? No, not really. If he wants that, he puts Jaru. He puts trill. He puts the sign of trill. But he really wants, and that's it, simple. You can't do it. That you can't do. No. Okay. Okay. Look at, sorry, it's not you. Together. You hit me a little bit earlier. I think I do a little bit like, like this, right? A little bit. You sound like an old piano. You can't play the <laughs> you know? I don't know, because sometimes on the, I'm not sure, on the harpsichord, they use that technique, no? Uh, for voicing. Um, yeah, but you know, they do it for another reason, okay? But for the piano, you don't need it. You don't need to do it, you see? <laughs> you have to understand that each instrument has its characteristics, okay? And also its limits, okay? Especially harpsichord playing, that is playing the harpsichord music on the piano. It's not that easy, you know? Sometimes we can't do it because the, the action, the action of the harpsichord is much lighter than the piano. So you can go much quicker than you can on the piano. Understand? Okay, let's go for the first repeat. <laughs> Is that you? Can you make that long? No, you have to be Is that you? That's not correct. You have to play. That, that sign, that's what it means, okay? You understand what I'm trying to say? Uh -huh. So you mean more melted? So that means one, in, how do you say that? One ornament flows into the other ornament. Okay, yeah, it's two separate. Yeah. So you, if you want to make a long. What I would first the ornament and the bass. Okay. 
because it's important. He will lose his day. So I It's not possible, okay? I mean, the slur is like uh, when the when the trill is from the down note, so it's like right. That's when yeah. the, that's the slur. Yeah. When yeah. it's the uh, when it's the little uh, wave things, it's like it's for. Um, I mean, you have to play out with the with the upper notes, right? But when you, listen, in Ramo, most of the trills are uh, indicated with this uh, this little wavy thing, okay? Yeah. If he he wants, uh, for example, you to begin on the note, for example, that's a note, but that's what they call a mordant. That's a mordant, right? And Sam? Yeah. Okay. Can we take... <clears throat> I just did it before the time, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Be careful that you play the ornament on the beat, not before the beat. That's important. Okay, so can we do the second reprise? Okay. Wait a minute, Zhao Yu. Please be careful your left hand. Now you. <laughs> yeah, 
this is difficult to play on the beat. Uh, the, uh, get the habit of playing your ornamentation on the beat. <laughs> You know, very, and not only that, he was very picky about tempo. I mean, you know, uh, how do you say that? Rhythmical precision. He's not a, you know, Ramo was a dry, a very dry man. <laughs> he looked dry, very severe. He had the most severe, but he had fire. He was fire. He was a very fiery composer. So what makes his composition so interesting is the fieriness, not the sentimental part, no. <laughs> so this fire we reserve, for example, a pool or the, the, for the gavot, okay? So we've done that, right? So what would you like to do now? Should we do the pool or should we do uh, the grand gavot? Whatever you prefer. I think let's go to the gavot first, okay? What do you think about the this piece? I mean, what does it say to you? Huh? As a piece? Uh, I don't know. It sounds like uh, I mean, at the at the beginning, I don't really know, but at the end, it it sounds uh, kind of like a, a like a reborn a little bit. I don't know. It sounds like a it's quite one mm. little piece at the end. I mean, like yeah. Listen, this piece, the gavotte, is Ramos' most profound and most important work. This theme and variations. He has other theme and variations. For example, the Nie de Solon. Those are theme and variations. You know that. But this, the gavotte, the gavotte. He calls the gavotte a big double. Double means variations, right? So I would like you to play it for me, the theme, because the theme is most important, okay? All right, try it. Right? Thank you. 
well, we can take it from there. The same thing. Good. Personally, I think you can sound grander. You know, it's you're sort of playing sort of mezzo piano, right? I, I don't have any. Uh, oh, you mean should be? Should be. Because I think the theme of the gavotte should be a very noble, but big, big theme. Okay? You can't play that. It has to be much more imposing. All right? So even from the To the E? Yeah, you have to take your bell off so we can hear the rest. Okay. You still have to hear it. You still have to hear it, right? Don't go too slow, too, too soft. I make this really approach was a little bit I thought the, the beginning was like more um, intern you know <laughs> <laughs> no when you do theme and variations it's the theme that gives you the character of the variations it's not that the variations give you the theme you understand so if you want to have an imposing piece you have to play 
imposing. You can't play like you did. Big, yeah, you know? Maybe here it's more, it's a little bit less. Maybe yeah, like you're making a concert. Yeah. And one thing is very important is you never play too quick. So, on the beat. Yalla. Okay. Cut. For right hand, or we keep the left hand, right? You can keep the left hand, take the pedal away. You can't have a silence if you have the pedal. Would you take uh, the away? Yeah, okay. You know, personally, if you ask me, I would not play this piano because. You need that piano in measure nine. If you already give it four measures before, then the piano doesn't have a big effect, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I would keep the same thing. That's right. Good. You understand? Yeah. Good. So we just gotta go quicker. Now, what how do you do this? First, the first variation, what do you do? You mean the speed or the... Yeah, no, yeah, usually the speed... It's the a little bit quicker, right? We can do? Or... No, no, it should be, the first variation should always be in the same tempo as the theme. You don't change... Okay, so tempo. later we can do quicker. You can speed up later, yes, but the first one you have to have, the first variation should always be in the tempo of the theme, okay? So, so that has to be the same tempo. Uh -huh. Personally, you know what? I think to make this, I play very light. Basically, you mean uh, a detached? Yeah. So you can hear long. Because you had to do that without pedal. Ha ha. Try it. <laughs> okay, good. Not bad. I would like to hear some more thumb. Good. Don't slow down at the cadenza, okay? But as I say, if we want to really bring out the theme, lean a bit the hand towards the thumb. I had a question for, uh, yeah. for the repeats mm -hmm. uh, because in the video I sent, I think I, I only did the first repeat. I'm not sure. It's okay. Listen, with Ramo, you really have to play all the repeats because it's a question of accumulation of rhythms. He wants you to play the repeats so you have this accumulation, rhythmical accumulation, you see? Uh -huh. that, has, that has to go on since the very beginning. But if you only play one part, you miss half of it. My, the rule of the thumb, you want what you always have to see. If under number one, there's still music, which there is, then you have to play it. If there's just a chord, no, <laughs> okay. But if you have written music, which you do have, you have to play the repeat, right? Yeah. So same for the, for the bottom, I mean, the second. 
second one? Absolutely. E every, every, ah, now here in my edition, yeah, every, every variation has to be repeated. Every variation has to be repeated, okay? Can you take me to, let's say, measure six until the second, uh, how do you say, into the second repetition, right? <laughs> Now you, I think I would do So every two bars? Huh? So every two bars? No, every bar, listen. Legato in, in measures uh, 17. You've always been playing staccato. You have to play staccato all the way through. You can't change. You understand? 17. Where is it? Uh... 17. Two bars. That's 17. All right. <laughs> Okay, you can play legato. Because it's a contrast with the staccato you've been playing all the time. So you all this, uh, all this I'm playing legato, right? Okay, you can. I sort of like to keep it all staccato, but okay, you can. Okay. You can stop a little bit. Right? Yeah. But if you do that legato, your left hand has to be staccato. Okay? You can't have the both hands doing the same thing. You understand? Yeah. Try. Go ahead. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so the left hand you suggested was for right hand to play staccato. Right hand, you can either continue staccato. Or if you would like to play legato, then you have to play the left hand legato. Okay, yeah, I see. That's just... Yeah, that's fine. That's okay. That's what I prefer. Okay? That's fine. We can use. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes. 
Sometimes you can play a pejando from top to bottom. Top to bottom. Understand? Go ahead. Starting to play in tempo <laughs> instead of <laughs> sort of playing rubato in your bass. You have to, these are, are running lines, they have to be even. Okay. That we can do, right? <laughs> Precise. Good. So let's go to the second, third variation. Now, this is interesting, number three. You know why? Because in this dubla, I think you can play more rubato. Try to play a little bit more rubato in this variation. <laughs> Putting all that pedal. Do you need to play pedal? No. <laughs> don't. <laughs> you don't need it, right? Yeah, yeah, here, here we can play piano. And you know what? Staccato. Play uh -huh. this. You're not playing staccato. You're playing legato. Piano. So when you come back to the second part, legato, more rubato, huh? Okay, uh, why do we need all that pedal? Can't you play without the pedal? Okay? 
So yeah, uh, second time we always do a little, a little change, right, to the staccato. What What did you say? So you mean uh, the repeat second time? We always do a little bit of change of articulation. Yes, it's, it would be nice when we do the rep repetition to find another way of doing the same thing, but staying in the limits of what you're supposed to do. You understand? So it's not only that if you have a second and play the same material twice that you have to play the second time piano, you know? That's old fashioned uh, thought about how you should play the harpsichord or ancient music. You've got to use your imagination to find new types of, uh, uh, how do you say that? Uh, what am I trying to tell you? New types of articulation. You understand? Be phrasing too, right? It could be phrasing as well, articulation phrasing. But that is your duty. That is your fantasy that must come there. Okay. So this is a wonderful. I love this one. The fourth. Do. So don't play too fast. This is very. Sorry. Can you play that very staccato? You. you know, we are losing the thrill of these repeated notes because you're too fast. We said, little, 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 too fast. So what? Uh, you know, I'm trying to tell you that uh, this is the thrill of Play this. this is a fantastic variation, don't you think so? Yeah, I mean, he's 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 had he had a lot with that with repeated notes later too. <laughs> yeah, but if you can play the repeated notes even and not too fast, they sound thrilling. Sounds like rap music. Said, <laughs> ah, it swings. Good. Okay, let's go. On. Now, how do you play this? I'm very interested. What do you mean? Uh, the articulations or? No, I'm talking about the theme. No, no it's not quite. Do you understand? Uh, 
I do this like second time. Huh? I do this like second time. <laughs> It's impossible to keep the note then. That's fine. Okay. Good. Still, for me, it's a too quick. Because, look, the next variation, right, the double, is accumulation of what you had before that. If you play too quick, this double, then the does not sound so heroic, you know? So don't play too fast. More lyrical, actually. I would play that more lyrical. For the finale, I would arpeggiate. So try to arpeggiate. So we do we do we arpeggio on every every chord? Or because I only do it for the first chord. No, you can arpeggiate all that. It's the last variation, so you can indulge yourself, okay, <laughs> to make it grand. Yeah. That's jazz. <laughs> Done. Try. I haven't played. Yeah. 
how, example, uh, how, huh? Vinay, I, I, wait, I didn't get your question, sorry. I said, how loud can you play your bass? Ah. Uh, uh, Beginning. Yes, grand, good. That's the grand finale, right? Usually, if we if we repeat like second times, I mean not gen I mean not this variation, but in generally, do we can we add some ornamentations or? Well, you know, I think with. Um, either Cupra or Rameau, we don't need to. Really, it's almost a distraction, you know? So if you play Cupra, he absolutely forbids you to add anything. He said, do not add one ornament to my music, not one. He forbid, you cannot. So it's Rameau, not, a bit so it's more. Not like, uh, it's not like Bach, right? Uh, yeah, but with Ramo, you don't really need it. You don't need it. I mean, you can be make arpeggiation, but to add some curly cues here and there, it sounds a bit affected. You understand? It's a limited, I believe, yeah. You have to play very sober, <laughs> okay? You play too much. It sounds like you're playing Cupra. <laughs> You're playing the wrong composer. Cupra was much more poetic. Rameau is severe. Absolutely, you got to follow the line. You cannot do anything else. If you have to do exactly what he wants you to do, that's the exciting thing, to do exactly what he wants you to do. <laughs> 